I am a perpetual traveller through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the Scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. If you are ever asked for a Bible verse that explains the purpose of the Bible and what God's objective is for all of us, then the answer can be found in Ephesians 4 verses 11 to 13. Some of us have been given special ability as apostles. To others, he has given the gift of being able to preach well. Some have a special ability in winning people to Christ, helping them to trust him as their saviour. Still others have a gift for caring for God's people as a shepherd does his sheep, leading and teaching them in the ways of God. Why is it that he gives us these special abilities to do certain things best? It is that God's people will be equipped to do better work for him, building up the church, the body of Christ, to a position of strength and maturity, until finally we all believe alike about our salvation and about our Saviour, God's Son, and all become full-grown in the Lord, yes, to the point of being filled full with Christ. Therefore, everything that God has done, and the entire focus of all that is contained in the pages of the Bible, is aimed at one objective, to mature all of us, so that the fullness of God can work within us, so that we can become filled and flooded with God Himself. All of the revelation that is given to us is necessary to accomplish this. Both the New Testament and the Old Testament make their unique contributions to this purpose. Firstly, the Old Testament is a book of preparation. If we read the Old Testament, we find ourselves reacting in ways similar to the Old Testament men and women. We are prepared to feel the way they feel, to think the way they think. We discovered that they went through the same problems and faced the same difficulties that we do, and they have the same desires and needs as we do. All of the Old Testament is designed to prepare us to receive the truth that the New Testament brings which is the presentation of Jesus Christ. Starting in the New Testament, the four Gospels and the book of Acts present us with what Jesus was, who he was, and why he came. After the four Gospels and the book of Acts, there are three groups of letters, or epistles, where Christ is explained for us. The first group is headed by the letter to the Romans. We cannot mature as a Christian until we have begun to grasp what this group of letters explains, which is Christ in you. This is the secret of God's working in human beings through the presence of Christ. The second group of letters, headed by the letter to the Ephesians, explains the concept of you in Christ. This is the church, the new body formed by the Holy Spirit, and how the life of Christ is shared by men and women of all ages in the body of Christ. The third group looks at the word which makes all of these truths available to us. That is faith. This group is headed by the letter to the Hebrews. This brings us finally to the book of Revelation, which is the great fulfillment of all scriptures. In this book, all the threads of doctrine that have been running throughout the Bible come together. For some strange reason, many new Christians begin reading the Bible with the book of Revelation. But this is a mistake. What is it that makes us want to read the last chapter of a book first? If we do this, the book will plunge us into confusing stories of dragons and trumpets and bowls and seals with many strange sights and sounds and visions. Very few people would be able to make head nor tail of it. We, of course, would have no idea of what the visions and symbols mean. The question is, how do we tackle such a confusing and intimidating book? The book of Genesis and the book of Revelation have been described by many Bible scholars as the two bookends that hold the entire Bible together. In Genesis, we have the story of the origin of human sin, and in Revelation, we have the complete and final victory over sin. Genesis presents the beginning of human history and civilization. Revelation presents the end of both. The problem of sin that started in the Garden of Genesis finds its solution in Revelation. In Genesis we learn the beginnings of God's judgment and His grace towards mankind. In Revelation we see the result of His judgment and the triumph of His grace. It is important that the book of Revelation has to be the last book of the Bible. 
if you have read the rest of the Bible before you come to Revelation, you will be so much better equipped to understand the climax of the entire revelation of God to his people. I would like to lead you through the book of Revelation, showing you the keys to understanding the book and to help you to understand what God is showing us. This is the way I have approached the study of the book of Revelation. I was helped along the way by many fellow believers, some famous and well-known, others not so. But each person helped me, and I would like to pass that knowledge and help along to you in this podcast of Revelation Revealed. If you read the first eight verses of Revelation, you will notice that this is the only book of the Bible which contains a promise of special blessing to those who read it. In Revelation 1 verses 3 it says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear, and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. There is no other book in the Bible that is more simple and logically written than the book of Revelation, in my opinion, once you understand and use the key to it. In the first chapter of the book, the Lord Jesus appears to John who is in exile on the island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea and tells him something. Firstly, Jesus says in verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I am sure that you might own books that have been signed by the authors themselves or you have attended the book signing session at a local bookstore. These books are more valuable or more unique because the author himself signed them, and you met the author personally and witnessed them signing it. Revelation 1 verses 8 is just like that signs copy of a book. God takes the pen in his own hand and signs the book with his own signature. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. He uses the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet to symbolize the beginning and the end of all things. He continues describing himself in this inscription as the one who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. In no other book of the Bible do we find this wonderful personal signature of God. When we read these words, we are reading a book personally autographed by the author himself. In verse 19, Jesus then says, Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. These verses are the key to the book of Revelation. The things that you have seen is what John sees and is found in the first chapter. Those that are is what occupies chapters 2 and 3. These are the letters to the seven churches as they were then. And those that are to take place after this occupies chapter 4 through the rest of the book. This is where the bulk of the prophecies are found. Therefore, Revelation is a preview of the course of human history from John's day until now, and concentrates specifically upon the closing days of the age in which we now live. With that key, the book should begin to fall into place. The reason why so many people have difficulty in understanding this book is not only because they have trouble with interpreting the symbols, but also because they fail to take note of the suggestions that are given in the first eight verses. If we read these verses carefully and thoughtfully, we will have a tremendous key to understanding this book. Working our way through the book of Revelation, we will recognize the identifying features of all the great themes of the Bible, and it is easy to tell in which Old Testament books those themes originated. In Revelation, we will see parts of Daniel and recognize bits of Joel, as well as hints of Isaiah and Ezekiel. In Revelation, we will see very clearly the unity of the Word of God. The title page of many books have some introductory remarks, and if you read them that way, you will be greatly helped in understanding the book. The title of the book of Revelation is in the first part of the first verse. The Revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him. The word revelation here is not plural. It is singular. The book is all about Jesus Christ. It is his self-revelation and it was given to him by God the Father to reveal to his servants. It says so in the next line to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. 
There are also two words in this first paragraph that reveal to us the special nature of this book. The book is called a revelation and a prophecy. The Greek word which is translated revelation is apocalypsis, which literally means an unveiling. A revelation is therefore a removal of the veil which obscures our understanding. It unravels the mystery. It explains the meaning. It is crucial to understand this book compared to the prophetic book of Daniel in the Old Testament, for instance. In Daniel 8 verses 26 it says, The vision of the evenings and the mornings that have been told is true, but seal up the vision for it refers to many days from now. And in Daniel 12 verses 4 it says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. The prophet Daniel was told specifically to seal up the words of the prophecy until the end times, and Daniel has remained a sealed book until only recently. This is in direct contrast to the book of Revelation. Jesus tells John specifically in Revelation 22 verses 10, And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. As we move through the book of Revelation, we will learn why evil persists on the earth, and what the ultimate fate of evil will be. The mystery of godliness will also be explained, so that we can discover how to live a godly, righteous life in the midst of a broken, evil world. The other word that is used to describe the book of Revelation is prophecy. Verse 3 says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. So this is a book that deals in predictions. It deals with people and events which lie in the future. This book was written by the Apostle John when he was a prisoner on the island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea, and it dates from about 95 AD, towards the close of the first century. John tells us that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and he began to see visions, revelations given to him by the Lord Jesus through an angel, of things which must shortly come to pass. So it is clearly a book of predictions. How the book was given to us is stated in the third phrase of verse 1. This is an important key to understand. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. The words he made it known are a translation of a Greek word, semeno, which means he signified it. Now look at the words signified and split it up in your mind into its components, sign and ified. So Jesus made the book known by signs or symbols. One of the most important reasons why symbols are used in this book is that it is dealing with things in the future which were beyond the imaginations of men and women of the first century. References are made to events that are only now appearing in today's world as fearful realities. Nuclear warfare, worldwide pandemics and massive natural disasters. How could these be described to a generation who knew nothing about guns or machines or diseases like AIDS or the coronavirus pandemic? When we want to try to convey some abstract thought or a difficult or mysterious event, we often put it in symbolic form. A simple example of this would be the bread and wine that is shared during communion at a Christian church. The bread and wine are symbols of something else. The book of Revelation uses symbols with great precision and clarity. The weird beasts and strange persons of Revelation are all symbols of things that are real and literal. As we progress through the pages of this book, many seemingly difficult images and events in the book of Revelation will become clear. The key to understanding any of the symbols of Revelation is recognizing that all of these symbols have been given to us elsewhere in the Bible. Without any understanding of the rest of the Bible, Revelation will confuse us. But if we use the rest of the Bible as a guide and interpreter of the symbols of Revelation, most of these symbols immediately become understandable. Revelation 1 verses 4 tells us who the target audience of the book are. John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. The first part of the book is a collection of letters specifically addressed to seven churches that form a rough circle in what is now called Asia Minor or modern-day Turkey. 
There were more than seven churches in that region, but these seven were selected because they are representative, not only of that day, but also of all churches of any day, and of the whole age of the church from beginning to end. We will get into that detail a bit later. This is the first time that a series of sevens are mentioned in the book of Revelation. Seven is the key number of this book. When you find seven of anything in this book, it is a symbol of completeness and perfection. The next set of the number seven that is mentioned is in the second part of verse four. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. What or who are these seven spirits? They are the Spirit of God in the fullness of his being. There is a reference as to what the seven spirits of God are in the verse in the prophecy of Isaiah 11 verses 2. Here Isaiah speaks of the Spirit coming upon the Messiah and mentions the seven spirits of the Holy Spirit in his fullness. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and the Spirit of might, the Spirit of knowledge and the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. It is the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who gives us this book, manifesting the Spirit of God in the fullness of his being. Jesus is the central figure of the book of Revelation, and here he is introduced to us for the first time in three ways in verse 5. Firstly, Jesus is described as the faithful witness. In other words, what he says is true. We can count on it. We need not ask ourselves what is right, because there is the word from the faithful witness, the one who tells us the truth. Secondly, Jesus is also called the firstborn from the dead. That is a reference to his resurrection. Jesus was the first one to rise in glory from having once been dead. All others who were raised from the dead in the Bible returned to the same earthly life they had before, but not Jesus. When he was raised, he was glorified, and it is that glorified life which he gives to those who believe in him. He is the life giver. Thirdly, Jesus is introduced as the ruler of the kings on earth. All the powerful leaders which we have today claim to be sovereign and able to accomplish their will, but here is one who is the ruler of kings on earth. He is the great lawmaker and is king over all other kings. So, in this passage, Jesus is introduced in threefold fashion as the truth teller, the life giver, and the lawmaker. Here in these two verses we have fully represented the triune God. The Father in his eternal sovereignty, the seven spirits signifying the Holy Spirit in his sevenfold abundance of power, and Jesus Christ, the faithful and true witness. They are united in giving us these amazing prophecies of the book of Revelation. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 18.